Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to welcome our guest, His Excellency Vice Chancellor of Research, Development, and Coordination of Universitas Pertamina, Budi Sucipto, PhD. His Excellency, the Dean of Exploration and Production Technology Faculty, Professor Dr. Rernat Awali Priyono, and His, His Excellency, the Head of Geological Engineering Department, Mr. Rio Priyandi Nugroho and Mendes, and all of our lecturers at Universitas Pertamina. And I would also like to welcome our speakers, His Excellency, the Head of Experimental Station for Groundwater, Dr. Ahmad Taufik, PhD, Her Excellency, Vice Dean of Faculty of Communication of, and Diplomation of Universitas Pertamina, Dr. Farah Mulyasari, SDMSC. Welcome, sir and ma'am. And our other speaker, the Director at Institute of Energy Infrastructure, Unitan Malaysia, Associate Professor Dr. Rahayu Cha Omar, will be joining us here later. And I would also like to welcome our moderator, His Excellency Mr. Imam Priyono MP, a lecturer at Geological Engineering Department, Universitas Pertamina. Welcome, sir. I would also like to welcome the participants for today. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our Environmental Geology and Geohazard webinar. Please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Ratu Anissa, and on today's occasion, I will be your master of ceremony. Before we begin our main session, I'd like to remind you to always be safe, be careful, and be aware with your environment. And in case of any emergency, please calm down and reach to your most safest and accessible evacuation route around you, and then go to a safer place. And that will conclude our safety induction for today. Without any further ado, we will continue to our guidelines of this webinar. Here are the guidelines. First, please make sure you already entering the room 10 minutes before webinar starts. And please use your name as your display name. Please turn off your camera and microphone during webinar. And participants are allowed to write down the questions in the chat room with a format of name, underscore institution, underscore to whom, and underscore the questions. And your question will be delivered by moderator in panel discussion. And this is the rundown for today's occasion. First, we have opening, followed by singing the national anthem of Indonesia, Indonesia Raya. And we will have some welcoming words. And then we're going to have a profile video playback of Geological Engineering Department. And then we're going to introduce you to our moderator, followed by the introduction to the speakers. And we're going to have topic presentation, followed by panel discussion. And then we're going to have the closing of today's occasion. For our next agenda, we will hear the national anthem of Indonesia, Indonesia Raya. Dear participants, please remain silent. <laughs> Oh, 
Thank you. And now we're going to have some welcoming words from Mr. Budi Suchipto, PhD, the Vice Chancellor of Research, Development, and Coordination of Universitas Pertamina. So, Mr. Budi, please, sir, the time is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, MC. I would be glad to, to welcome, on behalf of the Director of Pertamina, to our speakers today. Uh, Dr. Ahmad Topic, the head of Balai Air Tana, Ministry of Public Works, and then uh, Dr. Rahayu Jeff Umar from University Tenaga Nasional Malaysia, our uh, good partner. We've been a partner for the last four or five years. And uh, the last one, but not the least one, is our uh, lecturer. Senior lecturer, Dr. Farah Mulyasari. Uh, he is the expert, uh, he is the expert of uh, disaster risk management. To discuss this is very important topic today. It's about environmental geology uh, and uh, geohazard. I think we all know that geology is uh, it's a field that has uh, many applications in many, many areas, including uh, to minimize the risk of the, of the uh, hazard, for example. That, that's only one of the, of one of the roles. Uh, however, this uh, session is important because the session could inform people at large to be aware of the importance of this field as a researcher, as a professional, and also as a people. Uh, so I hope this session can provide uh, information, knowledge for the participants. I see, I don't know, we're actually uh, joined today. Almost uh, 100 participants uh, joined uh, today. So I hope uh, this session will be very beneficial for for uh, at least the participants. And I know that uh, this session uh, would be broadcasted in YouTube, meaning that uh, more people uh, will watch the session. So I think it's, uh, it's uh, very important for them to know what we are discussing uh, this morning. And to provide them with the ideas, with the uh, inspiration, the importance of uh, this uh, geology and geohazard. I, I will not take uh, too much time for today because I know there are three speakers and they are eager to share their, their knowledge. Um, on behalf of the Director of Institute of I would like to open this session. Uh, the discussion, and I hope all the participants will take advantage of this opportunity by asking questions, uh, by uh, discussing important matters maybe around uh, all of you, so that we can uh, leave the session later uh, this morning or uh, this afternoon with uh, some values that, that we all from from me. And again, thank you very much for. Uh, the platform of the speaker and from the opportunity uh, to have the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Budi, for your words. And then next, we're going to have welcoming work from Professor Dr. Renat Awali Priyono, the Dean of Exploration and Production Technology Faculty of Universitas Pertamina. To Mr. Awali, please, sir, the time is yours. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Honorable speakers, distinguished guests, students, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. First of, first of all, I would like to welcome you to this webinar, and I wish that we are all safe and well. The topic of this webinar today is environmental geology and geohazard. 
it is important issue and very relevant to the current condition in our country. Regarding to the natural disasters, Indonesia situated in the region which is rich of earthquake, volcanoes, and other potential natural phenomena that possible to create natural hazard. Aceh tsunami was followed by some important destructive earthquakes and tsunamis such as Nias earthquake, Yogyakarta earthquake, and Southern Java Sea tsunami. The other phenomena is liquefaction and landslide. Liquefaction and related phenomena have been responsible for tremendous amount of damage in historical earthquake around the world. We are still remember soil liquefaction which devastated neighborhood of Palu, Central Sulawesi, September uh, 2018. Therefore, as a country located in a natural hazard zone, there is some risk reduction strate strategic needed. The include of complete disaster cycle, management cycle, consisting of emergency response, rehabilitation, reconstruction, redevelopment, prevention, mitigation, preferredness, focusing in the specific character of every region. Therefore, according to this potential hazard, we need disaster risk assessment and demand of formulating disaster reduction strategies and action plan. Regarding to environmental geology, water resources is one of the most important resources for our life and development. In Indonesia, increasing population and development result the increase of demand of water. On the other hand, water resource viability has become limited and has been a critical level for several locations. The water pollution so far been occurring everywhere have tended to be polluted by waste from industries, domestic and agricultures. From the other side, over exploration of water resources make land subsidence become, becoming more and more serious, mainly in the big cities like Jakarta, Surabaya, and Semarang. Jakarta is home of more than 10 million people, but it is also one of the fastest thinking cities in the world. The related problem cannot be avoided in the coming years because the giant increase of population and industries. Jakarta is sinking by an average of 1 till 15 centimeters a year, and almost half of the city now sits below sea level. This is a challenge for all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope this workshop will play as a starting point for closer joint research activities between Pertamina University and domestic or overseas and overseas universities and of course government in the field of environmental geology and geohazard. Finally, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to Geological Engineering Study Program, Pertamina University, and organizer for their effort have made as this workshop is possible to be done. Thank you very much for your attention. Enjoy your webinar. Wabillahi taufiq wal didayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, Mr. Awali, for your words. Uh, I am very proud and happy to announce that Geological Engineering Department is the host for today's event. So this is a, bit, a little introduction from our department. Enjoy.
Now I would like to introduce our moderator for the next session. He is Mr. Imam Priyono, MP. Mr. Imam Priyono is a lecturer at Universitas Pertamina with academic background of Master Degree of Applied Hydrogeology in 2006 and Bachelor Degree of Geological Engineering in 2000, at 2003. Both are from Institute Technology Bandung. And his experiences and projects are lecturer at Universitas Pertamina from 2019 until now, and water resources capacity manager at Pitipirta Investama from 2011 to 2014, and engineering geologist and hydrogeologist at PT Freeport Indonesia from 2007 to 2010. And his publications are Visual Research Landscape of Surface Water and Groundwater Interaction. 1980 to 2017, published on 2018, then aliran air tanah pada sistem aquifer karst dan pendugaan dimensi dua dengan kombinasi metode geolistrik inversi dua dimensi dan mis alamas studi kasus kawasan karst buni ayu sukabumi jawa barat, published on 2006. To Mr. Imam, please the next session is all yours. Okay, thank you, Ratu Anissa. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Good morning ladies and gentlemen uh, I would like to say thank you for coming in this environmental geology and biohazard webinar It's great to see you all uh, Let me introduce myself, uh, my name is Imam Priyono I will be the moderator during this webinar session 
In this opportunity, uh, I would like to introduce the speakers at the webinar. The first speaker is Dr. Ahmad Topik, PhD. He is a head of experimental station for groundwater in Directorate General of Water Resources, Ministry of Public Works and Housing. His academic background is doctoral degree from Geological Engineering at IDB on 2019 and PhD degree from Earth and Environmental Science at Kumamoto University on 2018 and then his master degree from Groundwater Engineering at ITB on 2010 and bachelor degree from Geological Engineering at ITB on 2003. His experience and projects, uh, he is a chief editor of Journal Teknik Hydraulik and Journal Sumber Daya Air. And he also reviewer of environmental chemical engineering and bulletin of engineering geology and environment. He is a founder of Indonesia Peduli Air and a founder of Bio Water Channel Indonesia. His publication is controlling factors and driving mechanism of nitrate contamination in groundwater system of Bandung Basin Indonesia, deduced by combined use of stable isotope ratio. CFCH dating and socioeconomic parameter published on 2019 and his publication also uh, impact of excessive groundwater pumping on rejuvenation process in the Bandung Basin Indonesia as determined by hydrogeochemistry and modeling published on 2018 and then the second speaker she is uh, Dr. Farah Mulya Sari STMSE she is a Vice Dean of Faculty of Communication and Diplomacy at Universitas Pertamina. Her academic background, she is a doctoral degree from Global Environmental Studies at Kyoto University 2014. Uh, she is a research student from Global Environmental Studies at Kyoto University on 2010. And then she is a master degree from Resources Engineering at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, Germany on 2002. And then her bachelor degree from geological engineering at Universitas Pajajaran on, on 1999. Her experience and project, she is a lecturer at Department of Communication Science, Universitas Pertamina from 2016 until present. And she is a member of National Center of Excellence, COE for Carbon Capture Storage or Carbon Capture Utilization and Storage for Risk Communication and Public Engagement Division from 2014 until present. She is also a researcher of Center for Disaster Mitigation Research at ITB from 2005 until 2015. And then she also program manager of Community-Based Disaster Risk Management, CBDRM, for Indonesia-German Technical Cooperation on Georis between Indonesia Geological Agency and German Federal Agency for Geology or Georis Project from 2005 until 2010. And then we have the third speaker. Uh, she is Associate Professor Dr. Rahayu C. Omar. She is a Director at Institute of Energy Infrastructure Unit 10. Her experience is project uh, JK, Japanese Science and Technology, GST, Long-Term Research Project, LRGS MOHE towards geohazard monitoring with multidiscipline researcher. And then the second research is application of geohazard spatial data using photogrammetry and geospatial technology in virtual reality for the asset management business field with Tenaga Nasional Berhard Grid Division, TNB Grid, Sarawak Energy Berhard, SEB, and Sarawak State Public Work Department. Her awards, uh, the first award is Gold Award for SIVI RAM in ITEX on 2018 and then Leadership Innovation Fellowship LIF4 from UK Royal Academic Engineering on 2017 and then Best Academic and Research Excellent Leadership Award on 2016 and then Gold Award for Columnas in Impact USA on 2015 and then Gold, Gold Best Jury Award and IFA Best Award for Innovation PG Growth PG2S at Kiwi Seoul 2013, ITEX 2014, SIAF Seoul 2015, 
Inspect USA 2015 and Pencipta 2016. Okay, now we will continue to the presentation from the first speaker. Uh, now I invite the first speaker. Please welcome Dr. Ahmad Taufik, PhD. Please, the time is yours, Pak Ahmad Taufik. Thank you very much, Pak Imam, my college, also Professor Awali and Pak Budi at the University, Pertamina University. Uh, my presentation is, I will share first. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, this is the title of my presentation. It is the groundwater disaster. Why I say the groundwater disaster? Because uh, I think today and the recent issues, the groundwater is, uh, there is a problem in two issues. One, a quantity issues. The second, a quality issues. Now, uh, my presentation is coming deep or coming detail because this is my last uh, dissertation in the ITB and in Komamoto University. Uh, this is the two biggest issue uh, as a uh, groundwater disaster. Okay, <clears throat> this is my outline presentation. First, I would like I will uh, intro introduction. Second is case area or study case, and the third and the fourth is the two issues. One quantity issues and the second is quality issues. My study area in Bandung Basin. It is the uh, type in uh, urban issues. In the first issues, quantity issues is groundwater drawdown, and the second is groundwater mixing. And the quality issues, I use nitrate contamination. Why nitrate? I will explain later. This is the intimate relationship between groundwater and the city. Foster et al. in 2010 said that there is an intimate relationship between groundwater and the city. In the first figure, it's clear that if the city becomes enlarged, so there is two consequences. One, groundwater abscession become more and the water wash become more than there is the possibility to contaminate to the groundwater. This is the two figures. One is about uh, quantity. This is the groundwater. Then abstract become more and more. Uh, some dry become well. And this is uh, Professor Awali first land subsidence is coming. And my focus area, if the impact of groundwater deep or deep groundwater become lower and there is a contemplation this is what the uh, food uh, the next uh, impact because of the groundwater drawdown the second is figure about quality issues many water water here many water many water water come built in the urban area and also the second is also the precipitation become uh, contaminated Inflated precip precipitation, inflated to groundwater, leaky and coming down to groundwater. So the cyclus is clear in groundwater and abscessation. Since the uh, precipitation is contaminated, added with the western world, possible spill to the groundwater. So the two issues, one quantity, the second is quality. Now, uh, the background first for the groundwater drawdown. This is the figure of uh, my study area on our study area in Bandung Basin. They are clear in the deep groundwater, the red one, the red one contour or the dash contour. This is the deep groundwater contour. There is a contraction in here in Cimahi and Ranchaikol, Ranchaikek and Dayakolot. The three biggest deep con depression, there is such impact. But uh, why it, it, uh, the problem comes? Because the abstraction in the three biggest areas is significantly increased. 
Cimahi area, the biggest one, the second Rencekek, the third Dayakolot. Why Cimahi, Dayakolot, Rencekek, Dayakolot? Because this is the three biggest area of uh, industrial. The city, the fort, the, after the three biggest area. This is the response of groundwater uh, reported in the monitoring well, the red one and typically in Cimahi, the yellow one in Rencekek, and the third one in Dayakolot. From 1994 until now, the groundwater is slowly, slowly become deeper and become deeper. So what the impact? The, and the quality issues, so the groundwater has become changed, make, become dynamic because the deep groundwater is coming down and there is a potential flux from shallow and deep groundwater, from shallow to deep groundwater or from the right area of the left area coming flux from the because the groundwater tip is coming down flux in here become problem this is the typically uh, schematic of uh, impact of groundwater drawdown uh, down that we have, we have will discuss about this one impact of deep groundwater drawdown there is a flux, vertical flux from shallow to deep groundwater The second call, the second issue is quality issue. I put some sample uh, of natural contaminant in shallow and deep groundwater. It clear in shallow groundwater, there are many uh, some uh, put at uh, some point is become polluted, more than 10 milligram per liter. It means it's above, uh, beyond the standard. It we can call dangerous because 10 milligram per liter is the boundary to safe to become a raw water. Some area still yellow, still green, but some some many is yellow and tend to red. This is the fact uh, in 20, uh, in May, May 20, 20, 20, 19, May sample. And this is the deep water performance. And I put some um, I put many sample in different water. Some is uh, less, of course, because uh, less contaminated. But we have to consider that some area, some well is uh, the nitrate is uh, more than three. This is the shallow and the uh, concentration and frequency in shallow and deep water. The type, the typical of grab, the typical frequency is different. Why I choose a, a nitrate? Because nitrate is primary groundwater contaminant in the world most often in uh, urban city. And with this concern of particular importance of environmental problems. Why I choose nitrate? Because nitrate is stable, soluble, and mobile. If we, if we choose the nitrate, as we can, uh, many issues can, can related with the contaminant. Okay, I'm going to the study area. I choose Bandung because Bandung Basin is capital as, as a city of West Java. And West Java is the most populated province in Indonesia. So it is the typically of the city area. Now I'm going to the uh, simplification geological uh, or hydrological setting in the Bandung Basin. Shallow groundwater, I should, I say uh, to uh, to say that, to assume the shallow and deep water, shallow uh, abstract from Komsen formation. This is Komsen formation. This is the Akitar, and the deep water of the drill well more than 18 uh, meter, and mostly by using by industrial and this is a lower Chibram formation. This is Chibram formation. This is Komsen by Akitar. So uh, by uh, hydrological is difference. And uh, people saw the shallow and deep water. Just assume. Okay, we are going to the data first about groundwater uh, contour. For deep, for shallow groundwater, there is a typically the groundwater flow is coming to the center and controlled by mon, uh, geomorphological. Come to the come to the center of basin and typically in here come from the peri-peri to the center. 
this is the soil chronometer and i compare between two years and almost same almost same to to uh, to 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 period but in deep and water is still same with the before i uh, in first slide the, in the before slide there is a still three uh, different area three depression areas Chimahi, Ranchankek, and Dayakolot is still come in today in the three biggest area. So now I'm going to the quantity issues. I found the, uh, my method at basing the groundwater aids to clear bed, uh, to invest it if, if there is a rejuvenant aids from shallow at the deep groundwater. So I choose pressure by groundwater aids. This is the age CFC12. This is the uh, young age. Young age. So it is clear because young age, many of shallow groundwater is young age. Uh, higher is become young, young, younger uh, CFC. Uh, is more CFC, it means younger uh, age. Here we can show that less CFC is older. So if we found the higher CFC, it means, it means younger. Some of spot in the Chimahi and some in Ranchai is also the record. Some spot is some content of CFC 12. It's, it's interesting. So I plot in the three biggest area, they plot, this is the Chimahi, this is the Ranchai and this is Chimahi. There is indicated in deep water, the dot one, some content CFC 12. Some contain CSC12, so some contain CSC12. It means deep water contaminated from shallow to shallow from tomb country, then the retrofilling age processes. The, the age of shallow become young. I also make a I also make a groundwater modeling to investigate about the floods. This is the model by mud flow. I put many uh, I many put my well and also the lock board. This is typically of cross section. I I separated two, one shallow and deep water, two investigation that between shallow and deep water. And and the second I make calibration the model because before I run the model in three period area it's same between the monitoring well and also the modeling result if the match oh i'm going to the model sorry i'm still in there okay no this is the flux this is the clear from the model of flux this one the model of flux this is the calculated groundwater pumping and the consequence flux from shallow and deep water the response is the typical grab is same so because the groundwater pumping flux from shallow to deep groundwater is occurs second and the, the third i also make the total mixing ratio between shallow and deep water this is the mixing ratio to investigate how the mixing between shallow and deep water from all parameters. It's also interesting the result in the Chimahi, which is the deeper uh, groundwater daughter, the mix is more than the three, the, than the two areas others. So in Chimahi, red one, mixing is more than the three in Chankak and Daya Kolot. Now I'm going to the quality issues. I say I separate in the three area, Chima uh, and the uh, and the in the three area in body field, urban area and plantation area. I separate sample in the three biggest area because I want to uh, what the rest, what where is the first come uh, nitrate in the groundwater. I use nitrate isotope. Where nitrate isotope? It is the stable isotope to investigate to know the source of nitrate. Some nitrate become maybe from the atmospheric or precipitation, some because of fertilizer, some maybe from manure acceptiveness. From the isotope of nitrate, we can determine where is the source of uh, nitrate. This is the possible source 
from shallow groundwater. This is I plot in the graph of nitrate of 18 and auto oxygen 18. So the plantation from a fertilizer. So fertilizer uh, the can in, uh, ship is to groundwater as become conometer nitrate. But the urban area acceptive is in Indonesia on a Bandung basin here, there is a bad acceptive uh, in shallow and in all urban area. Some leaky, the leaky, leaky in to groundwater that contaminant. And the part of field is fertilizer. So this is the source in deep groundwater, in shallow groundwater. In deep groundwater, some contain if natural groundwater, it is in from its fertilizer and recharge area and some contaminated water and trapped It's clear it is it is clear that the our deep groundwater, because shallow groundwater come to deeper, safety waste contaminated the deep groundwater. This is groundwater flow system, I think. Uh, this is the recharge area, groundwater coming to the center. Uh, this is typically the young ORP becomes slow to the deep groundwater, dilution in here, denitrification, and mixing an area. This is the zone of groundwater flow in Bandung Basin. So the conclude is the nitrate sum of shallow groundwater exceed the industrial standard limit. It's called dangerous. Source of nitrate groundwater is anthropogenetic activity, septivis, and cell chemical fertilizer. Now, this is the, uh, the last discussion about groundwater age related to the uh, nitrate. And this is a good relationship between age, between age from CFC 12 and the nitrate concentration. There is a trend nitrate to become more and more in the, uh, in the our recent area. And I make a relationship with socioeconomic parameter population density, uh, GDP, groundwater growth, built area and green area, and also semi-cave waters and Bandung Basin since 1950. Most relationship sum between and shallow and deep groundwater. So I make a PC analysis that the, our nitrate is related with the primary groundwater growth. So primary industrial and population growth become primary driving force full to the nitrate contaminant. So this is the conclusion. This is the age of nitrate contaminant residence. And PC result is the primary driving is industrial agronomic population growth. The second, just chemical fertilizer. This is indicate the nitrate in groundwater as good indicator of growth of the study era. OK, uh, this is the last. Uh, I invite student here, also the lecturer in here, to collaboration with my ballet, Ertana. I invite some student to join KP. KP is KP, or the Indonesian KP is uh, KP, Kuliah Kerja Praktek, also the uh, scripsi in my ballet, uh, Ertana. Thank you very much. I, I come back, to, uh, I, 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 I would like to thank you to the audience and also the to moderator. This is, thank you, Pak Imam. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ahmad Taufik, PhD. And now we continue to the section speaker. Please welcome uh, Dr. Farah Mulyasari, STMSC. Please, the time is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Pak Imam, for your kind introduction. Let me first share my presentation. Okay, uh, can everyone already see the presentation here on the screen? Is my voice also clear? Yes, clear, Bukara. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, very good morning to all of you. It's a pleasure to be here to give the talk about disaster risk management for urban regions. I would like also to say uh, greetings to our vice chancellor, our dean, and also the head of department of uh, geological engineering in University of Pertamina, dear students, and also Pak Imam itself, and all my colleagues, lecturers in Universitas Pertamina. Dear participants, and also good morning to you, Pak Ahmad and Professor Rohayu. 
yes, I would like to talk now about disaster risk management for urban regions. So I would like to begin the presentation today with the outline. Uh, there's not so much outline that I can share for the short amount of time of uh, sessions. First of all, I would like to talk about the exposure and emerging urban risk that is overshadowing the cities and also the rationals why we need to have urban disaster management and uh, how we can actually manage the urban disaster in a city context. Uh, for example, I would like to show you about some of the assessment that we have did for uh, a few years ago for urban disaster management. Okay, to begin with the presentation today here, I would like to show uh, to you two graphs. So the fact that the world is becoming uh, increasingly urbanized is recognized by the UN in the State of the World Population Report. As the urban millennium, so by year 2030, the United Nations um, experts uh, expects more than 60% of the population to be living in the cities. And by year 2050, the world's urban population is expected uh, to grow by 3 billion people. So most of this growth will take place in developing countries with the urban population in cities and towns are doubling. Mm. So therefore, as of today, mm. more than half of the global population resides in urban areas. And by 2050, two thirds of the world's populations and the vast majority of the wealth and economy will be concentrated in urban areas. So viewing at the right side, uh, regional wise, Asian developing countries are experiencing more rapid urbanizations. So these figures on the right side, as you can see here, illustrate the global and Asian urban and rural populations, which shows that the trend of urban population in Asia is increasing. So what does that mean? This urbanization as one of major urban emerging risks that is occurring in cities is a concern. And particularly where local infrastructure institutions are extremely important to cope with the impacts of more extreme climatic events that we have endured until so far. So other emerging urban risks that may exacerbate at risk to climate related disaster as as follow. So as you can see here on the second slide that uh, the ever-growing urban populations in terms of urbanizations and adequate resources to fulfill its uh, services to citizens are significant risks that is shadowing the cities. So cities are places for opportunity, but as well as vulnerable spots to disasters for human beings. In cities, both populations and wealth or economy are accumulating and lead to higher Exposure and consequently increasing to disasters. For example, like uh, the flood damage potentials, uh, which can actually exacerbate the condition in cities. So we know that the urban population or urban areas are very much complex and have intrinsic elements that affect people's life. The cities aggravated by disasters will uh, actually um, have these underlying risks, such as issues closely linked to urban poverty and also um, on the pressures on land use that is causing uh, informal settlements are, that push people actually migrating and living on the high risk in the cities. This is actually conditions and being exposed to disaster events, lack of basic supplies, for example, and ecosystem services, loss of urban green, green spaces, unplanned development, and inadequate for example, hygiene. So this all, what does this all lead? So keeping the emerging urban risk in mind, on the other hand, the international database uh, has recorded that over the years, um, the trends of climate-related disasters, particularly floods, are increasing, and that's affecting more people and causing um, more economic damage in uh, economical terms. Although the geophysical disasters, such as earthquake, tsunamis, volcanoes, uh, volcanic eruptions, are recorded as the deadliest disasters, but therefore it is thus at most important important to assess the local potentials that may increase uh, the community resilience to climate related disaster events. So moving on to the next slide, uh, I would like to, uh, to say here that um, the, geophys the geophysical here uh, disaster it toward uh, comparing to climate related disasters in Asia is very much um, uh, having a closely the, the numbers, but the impacts is totally different. So for example, 
moving on to the next slides. If we're taking Indonesia as the, as the fourth uh, populous region uh, inhabitants in the world with almost 260 million uh, people, um, is the world's uh, largest archipelago with more than 1,700 thousand islands. So moreover, Indonesia is the fourth ranked country in terms of that I have said before, the populations, and also lives in the low elevation coastal zones. What does it mean? So coupled with being in the center of active uh, tectonic zones, Indonesia is as well susceptible to climate change risks. So clearly climate related disasters overshadowing, this, overshadowing the country such as hydrometeorological disaster, if you can see here at the right side of the graphs. So this dominate the contributions of more than 70% disaster events, more than 50%, 15% casualties, and more than 6% uh, of total affected, and more than 50% of the total cost. This is recorded data from international database. This also shows that out of the climate uh, related disaster, hydrothermal Hydrometeorological disasters such as floods are occurring frequently and affected most of people in Indonesia. Here on the next slide, I would like to say that therefore, uh, reflecting on the backdrop of this emerging urban risk, which are the risk drivers and taking the shape as stresses to cities and uh, vice versa, impacts from climate change and its related hazards are shocks due to their unexpected events. So the high intensity of the number of the pressures or the stresses may overwhelm a defined system of a city. So if additional unexpected shocks, uh, pressures are added to it. So accordingly, the linkage between the stresses and the shocks leading to disasters is likely to occur. So if various systems like physical, social, social, economic, institutional, and environmental aspect dimension in the city within a community fail to cope with uh, specific natural hazards. So just the increasing climate-related disasters in urban areas, the shaping as a high frequent and low consequence events such as regular floods and local inundations in the context of climate change. So these are pushing the cities to urgently uh, address locally distress. So since the impact of disaster will actually largely felt at the local level. So cities needs to have the capacities in overcoming the disaster impact. Cities need to assess their current capacities in reducing its risk. So what does it mean also? City needs to assess its resilience in different aspects that include in cities system, like these five dimensions, physical, social, economic, institutional, and environmental sectors. So therefore, the context of urban resilience is based on inherent capacity of the cities to bounce back, to have the capacity to recover after disasters. So the context of resilience, therefore, is closely related to risk reductions. And therefore, it is appropriate to understand the risk reduction tools and methods in order to able to build resilience in cities. So the next slide, I would like to show that the urban risk disaster management, especially in cities, are strongly encouraged by international framework. Previously, we have Hyogo Framework for Actions. Now we have the Senda Framework for Actions that is from 2015, taking up from the Hyogo, actually disaster reduction uh, framework, uh, to Sendai Framework from 2015 until 2030. So there are actually um, strongly uh, four priorities that the cities or the urban area and also the all the regions in the world should follow. So the, the third priority, investing in disaster risk reductions for resilience, give us actually the rationals to do the, uh, the resilience assessment in order to have disaster risk reduction actions uh, and of course, together uh, uh, incorporating in the urban plannings and the building codes. So how do we measure actually resilience in a city? So here in this method, I would like to show you the tool name like Climate Related Disaster Resilience Index or uh, named shortly uh, CDRI. It is to assess, it's the method to assess the climate related disaster resilience at the local level. So its origin was developed uh, 2007, we know as our, 
research students. Um, and also a few years ago, we have updated the methods during the PhD studies with various researchers in international environment and disaster management laboratory in Kyoto University. So in 2011, in 2014, this tool was refined and is improved with parameters and indicators. These tools has assessed 33 cities in Asian regions, and these tools, CDRIs, aims to measure the current capacity of different characteristics of urban community, including the provisions of basic urban services. So as you can see here, it spans from five dimensions in the city, from starting from physical, social, economic, institutional, natural, or environmental dimensions. So these tools also developed for the local level to better incorporate the micro level diversity. For example, the CDRI can be integral component of the climate disaster resilience initiatives that can be integrated in their uh, land use development program. So it is a planning tool that aims this as uh, a sustainable development through increasing disaster resilience of the cities. So how do we measure it? So we have uh, this baseline data uh, accumulated from not only from the city level, but also from the sub-city levels like Jamatan and Kelurahan, we, which we have actually measured since 2010. So it's about one decade ago. So it goes periodically uh, within uh, between five years period. So we have measured in 2010, 2015, and in 2020, the process is ongoing. So by the end of uh, this month, uh, we can publish the results results of the uh, measurements of climate related uh, disaster resilience index for West Java province and for Bandung city. So why uh, at the sub city level? Because they are knowing their context very well, uh, each of the area from the perspective of disasters and it could provide the required expert information together collaboration with the geoscientists of course, and the involvement of cooperation from other local government agency. So how do we measure it? It is a full package of questionnaires contains of five dimensions, 25 parameters and 125 measurements. So when we have measured and comparing with other cities that we have measured in Asian regions, for example, Bandung city is still ranked in 30th place. So we do hope that in 2020, its resilience will be enhanced. So how would the result look like? So this result shows us that uh, there are two types of the results. So the results are spanning from the uh, visualizing the strength, capacity, and weakness, and also uh, the spatial analysis at the uh, later slides. So these uh, uh, strengths, capacities, and weakness of the entire uh, visualization of the cities actually give us the information on the resilient assessment at the city level that supports the local government in pointing out the weak and the strength, pointing out the weak sectors and the stronger sectors. So this assessment more offered at the sub-city level at the micro entities like in the Kecamatan level, in Kelurahan, at the micro cities actually help or support the city government to contextualize better their specific disaster risk reductions. So it can also reveal local potentials that may actually enhance um, these five sectors in the city, like in physical, social, economic, um, and institutional and environmental dimensions. So the second format is how uh, actually the result be visualized in a special analysis. This special analysis gives us actually uh, the overview of the city government, the information on which the locations and the key areas uh, they need to focus on and together collaborate with, the lo with their local governments, with the local expert to strengthen the disaster risk reduction in the urban areas. So uh, uh, I'm coming toward to the end of my presentations. Thereby, uh, of the almost uh, one of the last slides, I would like to share, uh, to point out and to stress that by enhancing and uh, implementing the resilience assessment, it can actually um, trigger the local actors and the experts uh, have their crucial part, have their crucial actually role, role in communicating common risk to wider communities, to wider public. So thereby, by reducing the risk in a city as a part of urban disaster risk management.
I would like to close the presentation today. Oh, my thought of share of today to all of you by having the statement of the former UN Secretary General Ban Ki Moon. That is actually uh, most relevant what we have uh, endured so far that the urgent call for urban disaster risk management is important more than ever. So seeing the situations that, that is worsening by uh, La Nina and climate related disasters, he said that it is actually he calls for the need of the world leaders to address the climate change and reducing the increasing risk of disasters, especially from the mayors, townships, of course, from the community leaders. So by this statement, I would like to, uh, to close my presentation today and I welcome you the questions and happy to answer your question today. Thank you very much for your kind attentions. I will give it over to Mr. Imam. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Farah Mulyasari, SDMSC. And then now we continue to the third speaker. Please welcome the Associate Professor, Dr. Hayu C. Omar. Please, uh, the time is yours. Oke, okay, Dokter Profesor Dokter Rohayu C. Omar, please. Yeah, uh, I'm sharing. I'm sharing my uh, presentation. Oke. Okay, okay. uh, Uh, can you see? Uh, not yet, Mr. Hayu. Great, eh? Um, can organize the uh, share? Uh, my presentation. I okay. Did, uh, because okay, uh, wait I, a minute, Michelle. Okay. Assalamualaikum and uh, good morning. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, organizer. Uh, and assalamualaikum and good morning uh, for uh, all keynote speaker and the participants. Um, I'm today uh, would like to present and sharing uh, my experience on uh, geohazard monitoring system. Uh, that's uh, 
one of uh, geohazard monitoring system uh, that uh, we are using now is called Ritual uh, Geohazard Monitoring and Asset Management System and short form that we call WIGMAS. Eh? Uh, actually, this uh, project is uh, is uh, our project that we de uh, develop and implementation uh, for uh, Tenaga, uh, which are our uh, parent company, uh, TMB, uh, mostly they call TMB. Uh, that's uh, the, then uh, this system uh, can can go to next one. Okay, uh, this system are developed because of actually uh, influence of uh, landslide uh, to uh, Malaysia, especially the occurrence and causes the economy losses to the asset and fertility to human. Uh, due to that, uh, there is a need that uh, to develop an integrated mapping technique for evolution landslide zone in critical infrastructure planning and management. Okay, this integrated uh, mapping technique uh, is actually uh, integrate uh, system uh, from the pre uh, that's mean the common uh, site mapping uh, based on uh, that we use a uh, in Malaysia we use a British standard uh, then it integrate to with uh, land uh, land use planning or uh, physical planning uh, uh, process then based on that uh, we uh, we call that the integrated mapping technique. Then we used to uh, integrate eh, uh, all the data that require into one platform that we call a uh, virtual reality environment. Then this virtual reality environment actually is a one-to-one -one scale uh, based on the site as well as visualized result in 3D environment. Uh, this system actually acts as an integrated uh, asset management system uh, that we achieve high reliability and maximize economy value uh, for um, that's I mean in this case uh, for Tanaga and it's also uh, prevention the uh, economic loss, environmental loss, and social loss. Eh? Okay, uh, next please. Okay, uh, actually, uh, why uh, this, uh, they need this, eh? why they need uh, virtual geohazard monitoring uh, asset management system or WIGMAS? Because uh, this WIGMAS actually can integrate uh, at all the asset and all the condition of environment and social in one management system to achieve high reliability and maximize economy value uh, for TMB grid asset. In, uh, the TMB is referred to uh, Tenaga. Uh, then uh, the second one, this week must actually integrate both secondary, secondary data, that's mean all data, including uh, all uh, geological maps, as example, as you, as you land use maps and others map that uh, normally we use for uh, to identify the geolo uh, geological and condition of uh, geohazard. Then we need our primary data that obtained from in-situ ground data, data set of mapping of terrain, and also as well actually, we uh, integrate a technologist uh, in terms of satellite images uh, to create virtual reality environment in one-to-one -one scale. Uh, based on the site as well as uh, visualize result in 3D environment. In this case, meaning that whatever you see in this virtual reality, actually you can, uh, uh, is you know, it's similar to what actually at site. This this actually helpful for governance actually because uh, governance, uh, some of the uh, in government sector did not go to deep to the uh, Slide us to the site, then they need this uh, technology. Then the third one is uh, the, uh, this system help to promote efficient and transparent practice in managing risk and the aids in governance process. Okay, uh, the next please. Okay, uh, before we uh, 
uh, that's me before we go uh, to develop the uh, technology of mitigation uh, or monitoring purpose or this Geohazard uh, monitoring, we need to know what actually the problem, what actually the uh, issues that uh, goes uh, or occur in that uh, tenaga. Eh? Then uh, we found that there is a um, various issue, but in this uh, webinar, I, I, I will explain two issues that one is related to the slope monitoring and maintenance. That means uh, the, the in, that's mean uh, what what they have the, uh, uh, the, they they develop the uh, area, but now they need to monitor and maintain. That's mean in terms of develop uh, the development. That's mean is already developed. Eh? Okay, uh, what we uh, have the the problem, they, they uh, we can sign uh, signs of instability, uh, erosion, slight subsidence, and uh, there are too many. Uh, in the the particular area, uh, especially uh, near to the or on the uh, on the side which has a transmission tower or subsession uh, tower. Okay, then uh, we found that is uh, untended or undetected uh, can es escalate into more serious than costly problem. That means there is uh, intention that the slope will be fair if we not. Uh, monitor or not maintain, <coughs> not, not go to for uh, maintenance, they will cause a serious uh, problem. Then uh, later on, they will give uh, costly to the clients. Eh? Then the third one, uh, we identified uh, critical slope and ground two priorities for timely repair. Meaning that when we detect, we, uh, we need to identify which actually the slope is critical and uh, what we need to do. Then we need to prioritize, uh, for example, for repair that particular slope. Then I did, we need to identify and generally classify what type of method or remedial method according to the suitability of the type of failure and the site condition. Next, please. The second problem is uh, uh, based on the what we call the route and substation that's uh, selection. This is a planning process uh, that uh, before we develop the route of the transmission tower and for the substation selection. Yeah? Okay, uh, then what, why, why actually, what actually the problem is then we need to identify the transmission route line and substation effectively in consideration cost price analysis. Uh, then we need to know that the most um, shorter, for example, the uh, line is more shorter, but need to avoid the uh, particular landslide or need it to avoid the uh, where is a uh, hazard zone uh, as example beside the landslide might, might, might be uh, flats. Okay, then uh, when we identify the landslide and the flight zone and risk, we will avoid this hazard during the route and substation selection. Due to that, then we can identify the land parcel for consideration in cost pass, uh, analysis for planning and construction. Then we later on, we can identify the generally classified remedial method according to suitability of type site consideration. Uh, meaning that uh, we uh, in this planning we can identify uh, during development until uh, the process of uh, mitigation when it's uh, ready to be used uh, next okay um based on the problem what actually the requirement uh, then the, the need uh, the, the, this is must be a smart system. Then, uh, based on the smart system concept, we need to ensure that so they, they can manage asset in one systematic platform. They can provide technical data and information related to the tenaga. Uh, then, what actually we need to know? Uh, what actually their their current practice? Then uh, we know that the current practice is that they need to have an enhancement of uh, previous slope management system. They need to have an uh, enhancement of the previous process of, of 
new transmission route substation selection and uh, they will, pro uh, we will provide the information uh, planning and managing asset due to due hazards uh, as example landslide and flood uh, and also the uh, wind caused by extremely climate then we need also to manage encroachment problem in retis or due to development this encroachment actually effect to the uh, landslide so on uh, then what actually enhancement they need the enhancement uh, for integration data and technical process and govern governance decision then they need the most is the roi that's mean the return of investment uh, based on the transformation uh, transformation process that means that they, they need to know the economic value okay next please Okay, what is the methodology that we go by with mass? Uh, next. Okay, uh, I give an overview. The methodology, uh, we need to have a development production, uh, which is we integrate the data from site and also from, based on satellite imaging. Then we process uh, in data process, uh, processing uh, toward the, what they need based on the asset maintenance module, asset development module, flood and disaster risk management module. module. Then after on, uh, the, when we process, we get the result for two, then we visualize in uh, virtual reality and goes uh, then the case sit through the platform that we call uh, which uh, virtual information system uh, then this is actually categorized as a application development uh, that we can see the geohazard and management module executive desk module then also the module for uh, publics and client module comments eh? okay uh, next please Okay, uh, based on the, the development, actually we have uh, seven uh, components. Okay, and then the, the seven component here is actually uh, based on the, the needs uh, or the enhancement. But today, uh, I will explain the two uh, of the component that's uh, related to the grid maintenance and the grid development, how they use the uh, geohazard concept uh, in their uh, implementation on in their practice of work. Okay, next, please. Okay, uh, in uh, the first one is uh, actually uh, we use, uh, we need uh, a technology. That's why we install the ground station, uh, satellite ground station. Uh, you need to have a ground uh, satellite uh, station. Uh, then we collaborate with uh, agency uh, remote sensing Nagara. Uh, that's mean they, they use our uh, ground station actually. Then next please. Uh, then uh, that's mean the data uh, we receive, uh, we uh, get from the raw data. Uh, we, uh, we model it, we use in all uh, the process uh, in two hazard monitoring system. Next. Okay, uh, then uh, and now I will present the overview, how it looks like, how we use it. Eh? Okay, uh, next please. Okay, um, actually uh, there is a video to show that's how it works. Eh? Uh, if uh, later, if I, I can uh, show the video, I will show. Uh, but th this actually showing the, the, uh, we, uh, the house, uh, our virtual reality is look like uh, we have a lab uh, in unit 10 uh, possibility if uh, later on when go, COVID is go we, uh, uh, we uh, that's mean Petermina you still invite to come to unit 10 and see our our labs eh? uh, this used to that's mean we bring uh, your site uh, to the office that's mean you can see how the the condition of site and how you can use all the data that integrate in 3D and uh, whatever you see here you can see uh, that's me is similar to the site uh, then the scale is one to one scale okay uh, uh, then why where they need this eh? because they try to uh, use it for governance eh? for managing infrastructure uh, infrastructure uh, before and after construction uh, through virtual reality. Okay, uh, next please. 
Okay, uh, next. Uh, Uh, next, okay. Then I, I come to uh, slope management. That's mean in uh, grid maintenance because I uh, I did explain there is a seven module. Uh, uh, what I will explain uh, the two uh, module here is a grid maintenance. Then the, this grid maintenance uh, we uh, we divide to slope management and also the and uh, the enclosurement. That's mean how that's when they use. Uh, that's mean uh, the when there is a development. How the development will affect to the uh, uh, slope, eh? especially the slope in that particular area. Uh, next, please. Okay. Uh, this also the overview. Uh, uh, if uh, there is a video actually, um, in ritual data management, uh, we uh, we showing the concept how to develop it how to test it, how to analyze it. That's mean all the data integration, we show that's the area, the condition of the area, how we can use it to monitor uh, the slope. In this, uh, in this example, it's a uh, slope and how we can predict the ROI. Eh? Okay, uh, next please. Okay, uh, first, um, most because normally uh, geologists we go by um, their study. Then in this uh, in this study or in this system, we actually actually integrate the study uh, the study uh, using the concept of landslide hazard modeling analysis. That means we indicate the uh, which actually the area of the landslide uh, zone and also the landslide uh, risk. Okay, based on the landslide risk, we integrate in one system that uh, called disaster resilient index and indicator system uh, for managing risk. Okay, uh, uh, next, uh, next. Okay, uh, that, this is a death study uh, from the geographic information system analysis, GIS. Uh, we use a media resolution image uh, from our ground session satellite. Then we uh, we simulate and we model. Uh, we get the area, the zone uh, of landslide hazard man, risk area. That's mean the risk area. If you can see the, uh, that's mean the uh, dotted color. This dotted color is actually uh, the transmission tower uh, on the top of the slope. Meaning that if the red, this red uh, color, meaning that is a high uh, high risk zone. Okay. Uh, next, please. Okay, uh, for, as example, we zoom uh, from our uh, more this image uh, zone satellite. We zoom that that the slope which actually uh, in category of uh, high risk, uh, medium to high risk. We zoom in, then we try to see how it look like. Okay, the, because we try to minimize uh, from getting uh, go to slide because we need to reduce the uh, in term of monetary. Yeah? Uh, that's mean economic value. Then that's mean we zoom it then we con confirm that this side actually there there is a landslide. Then we need to go further for investigation. Okay, next please. Next please. Okay. Uh, and I, okay. Okay. This is a uh, how that's when uh, the process and eh, the methodology. Uh, meaning that when we go for their study, uh, we evaluate, we enhance the uh, low resolution to with uh, artif uh, artificial AI, artificial intelligence. Then we go to site. Then we have a system uh, that we develop using a smart system. Um, the smart smartphone. That means you can use either from Android or iPhone, and also from Windows. Then uh, we enter all the key points uh, to evaluate the condition of the slope. Then uh, we uh, that means the system we uh, calculate uh, how the slope is look like the risk of the slope. Then uh, we give uh, three colors here. That means red, uh, green and in this 
case the red is meaning that uh, not it's not uh, totally fake but that's mean uh, it's uh, have a sign to fail but sometimes it's uh, fail but not totally fail eh? then we need that when it's red they need to go for maintenance uh, a major maintenance uh, then the the yellow one is a uh, slightly uh, that's mean uh, they need to go for maintenance might be a simple maintenance then the green is a safe uh, slope then when we go to slide uh, to side actually we indicate how the failure of uh, the slope is look like then uh, from the data itself they will simulate and uh, rectify uh, actually what type of maintenance they, they need to be used in this particular area uh, this one is a uh, this is a conceptual design. That means uh, we give uh, an example of conceptual design. Then later on, uh, engineer, uh, civil engineer need to uh, doing the uh, that means the full concept of uh, mitigation. Eh? Uh, then based on the type of maintenance. We, we they use it we, we calculate then we can uh, we uh, later on after for example after uh, starting to five years later uh, we can predict actually uh, what actually the cost uh, benefit to uh, them eh? okay uh, next please okay uh, uh, this is an example to show that the detail eh? if the moderate potential how this example is look like uh, then what is the maintenance purpose? Uh, go uh, next. Okay. Uh, this also, uh, actually there is a video actually to show how the system is works. Uh, okay. okay, then uh, you, if you see the uh, at the bottom actually, how it look, uh, look like when we integrate uh, the data we collect from the system uh, into the virtual reality then we found how is uh, we you can see the how the terrain is look like how the hazard is look like uh, you can move or uh, that's mean the system can uh, we can rotate 36 uh, degree then you can see uh, if there is a failure is a there is a landslide you can see how the landslide is look like then we also integrate uh, all the condition of the site uh, site in that uh, uh, system. All the our system actually we have pattern uh, patented that we we get the uh, pattern uh, last three years actually. Okay, uh, next please. Okay, uh, this uh, to show you how how actually uh, when uh, when you see in virtual reality uh, how it look like the condition of the terrain and the condition of the data that we collect then we can view it in virtual reality eh? uh, okay next please okay uh, later on uh, when uh, previous okay uh, okay when uh, when we indicate uh, there is a high risk in the particular area then uh, then this actually uh, at the remote area the area and uh, the, the high risk slope actually in the remote area then we uh, need to monitor it by real time slope because if we monitor uh, all terrain or all slope is what we give um, a high value of uh, that's mean the cost is high then we select for based on the uh, really critical and the, uh, the slope is at the remote area. Okay, uh, next please. Next. Okay, uh, then, uh, no, uh, before. Okay, uh, this is a, a, a system, another system actually uh, is a real time. That means we, uh, we install all the equipment there. Uh, then we can see through the uh, our system, uh, virtual reality system, the condition, uh, real time condition of uh, the slope. Then we can predict uh, uh, based on the rainfall uh, that, uh, data that we collect and also the, there is a gauge. Um, uh, all the uh, equipment and uh, that's, uh, that's installation uh, related to monitoring system or the slope. 
uh, then they, we indicate that means in this condition uh, you can see that's all is a green that's mean uh, no failure occur uh, but this system uh, because we have for example last 20 on 2014 uh, we have um, um, that's mean the flood uh, is a major flood event uh, uh, in Malaysia on 2014, uh, uh, then uh, this cause of failure or uh, to that uh, this load that we install, then they indicate the uh, uh, the red color. Eh? Uh, uh, but in, uh, in this case, uh, when you this is a green color, that means this in this condition the slope is safe. Eh? Okay, and uh, next. Okay, uh, beside that, eh, beside what we are monitoring, actually because we uh, need to uh, go for design purpose, eh, uh, then we integrate all the subs, uh, surface data and also uh, subsurface data, either borehole or geophysic data uh, in one uh, uh, system, then we can use the system to calculate the uh, bill of quantity for maintenance purpose. Eh? Uh, how do we do that? Eh? Uh, next, please. Okay, uh, as example, when uh, you see this is one of the slope that's uh, filled uh, on 2014, eh? then they need a major uh, construction because of the slope uh, very uh, high in risk, uh, then uh, if you see this uh, tow tower is near to the uh, slope face, eh? then it's uh, then they, they they afraid that the tower will be fall uh, because uh, the late tower to the to the uh, lens the to the zone of fail actually uh, less than uh, one feet. Eh? Okay, then how we use it? That means we can use uh, uh, to, to measure the uh, size of landslide here. Uh, we can also measure the volume to be cut or fill. Uh, we can also visualize soil and rock texture. Uh, but this one we need to keep uh, to uh, compile all data and integrate into the system first. Then uh, if not, we cannot know uh, what actually the soil types? Eh? Okay, and uh, we can calculate the system from that uh, from the lakes. Eh? Then all this can use can be used for uh, when we need to design uh, for slope protection. Eh? Okay, next please. Uh, then uh, another uh, example as uh, we can use for uh, encroachment management. That's mean. Uh, uh, there is, uh, for example, uh, when um, deforestation occurs, as example. Eh? Okay, uh, next please. Okay, how, uh, how we develop it? Eh? Uh, we develop it based on uh, combination of uh, data uh, from the drone image, laser scanning, uh, satellite data, we integrate in this platform and uh, then uh, we can uh, measure uh, the canopy high uh, as example. We can measure the distance from the, uh, that's mean from the slope to the new development uh, based on uh, combination of uh, this integration of this data. Eh? Okay, next please. Okay, uh, one of example is uh, based on that data, uh, we uh, we actually model to get the uh, NDVI. That's mean the uh, the uh, col the index color of vegetation. Yeah? Okay, uh, if you we can see on the my uh, right side here, there is a clearing. So that's mean uh, the the line of transmission tower. There is a clearing. Um, uh, 20 meter by 20 meter uh, both side uh, that's that's mean this is clear then uh, this uh, this tower this line tower is safe if if uh, if there is an encroachment or new development here we can, we can see that how they we impact to the uh, this particular area eh? okay uh, beside that also uh, the because of the attack uh, of 
um, what we call win uh, win uh, win and also the uh, the uh, condition of um, encroachment. That means the for example, bull, uh, there is a bulldozer to uh, to come to uh, for new development. Eh? They we uh, influence also to the land this particular land. Eh? Then we can detect it. Eh? Okay, next please. Okay, uh, then, then uh, uh, as example, so we can uh, calculate the, the height of the tree that this tree actually we infect to the uh, uh, secret or the, uh, the blackout, eh? the national blackout of the, the transmission tower. When is there is a blackout, so they give a, a value of hazard risk. Eh? Okay. Uh, Next, please. Okay, uh, then uh, the uh, the second one we go by asset development. How we use the um, actually the risk assessment for the the new development of transmission tower or uh, substation. Uh, next, please. Okay, uh, this is a methodology. Eh? That means uh, we need to have a preliminary route identification. That means we did a death study. We using uh, death study, uh, GIS. We have a data acquisition. Then we go by the route analysis. That means uh, we choose uh, the uh, no, three to five lines uh, that's most relevant. Uh, based on the selected parameter that required by the uh, local planning uh, 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 agents. Eh? Uh, that means, um, in, in, uh, for example, in this case, uh, uh, we need to, uh, to integrate with the concept of that, that uh, what we call in Malaysia, there, there is a concept in planning uh, process and uh, when we need to develop is uh, that we call uh, environmental sensitive area and also the um, the terrain uh, analysis eh? and uh, the the ESA environmental sensitive area belongs to the uh, uh, local government uh, under agency of uh, planning and the terrain analysis uh, based on the uh, uh, geological department. Eh? Then we integrate based on because it's a requirement where we need to develop. Then uh, we choose it uh, based on the area uh, which is less uh, on the hazard. For example, less uh, uh, through the landslide and also less uh, through the uh, zone of flood. Eh? Okay, then uh, based on the, uh, we calculate the cost. Uh, and also the has, uh, hazard risk. Then we give a um, costing to the to the uh, tenaga. Uh, then they, they we, uh, we choose the best uh, route based on the uh, less hazard, and that's mean the value uh, of economy also high, eh? uh, not high. That's mean uh, good economic value. Eh? Okay, sorry. Uh, next, please. Okay, this is an example how it look like uh, because uh, sometimes when we have, uh, we need to select, uh, we need to uh, know also the existing uh, route. Normally, uh, they will go by the parallel to the uh, existing line. Uh, then uh, that's, uh, we can propose the uh, route. Then uh, also is, uh, it didn't, should be not to, um, uh, that's mean uh, goes uh, near, near to the road. Eh? Uh, we need to actually uh, avoid, eh? avoid it. Okay, uh, next please. Okay, uh, then what uh, uh, I go to for the last, uh, it based on the commercialization value, our concluding remarks um, here, uh, how, why actually uh, this uh, technology or monitoring system, Johazard monitoring system is uh, actually a, one of the good practice yeah? uh, because they can uh, give uh, or improve operational performance. 
uh, that's me they really um, uh, give a cost saving and increase a network protection from the jail hazard occurrence. Then the oppression risk cost for patrolling. As example, uh, the patrolling is the they need to uh, check. Eh? Actually, they need to check uh, their tower uh, to avoid them from failure uh, because of landslide or because of the flood or because of the encroachment. Uh, then this system actually helps uh, in terms of reducing uh, uh, patrolling. That's mean they can uh, previously. That's mean they go uh, every month. Then this system can uh, uh, we we introduce it by when you using this system. That's mean from one uh, every month they goes to the site. Uh, they can go uh, three months. Uh, that's mean uh, 12 uh, in one year, only four times. Uh, that's uh, as example. Eh? Then they can enhance the ability to strategi strategically uh, plan for long term uh, because uh, they know based on, on that uh, DRIM system, as example, uh, they, how that the maintenance cost will be saving uh, if they use uh, this uh, system. Then they can uh, maintain security of operation. Uh, that's mean uh, they can reduce the uh, route selection. Yeah? Uh, that's mean that they go for the best uh, sol uh, solution. They avoid all the hazard. Then uh, they can. Uh, uh, that's mean for the maintain or for the mitigation purpose. They will reduce that mitigation purpose. Okay, uh, from uh, myself. Uh, next. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, if uh, have any question, I will answer it later. Thank you from myself. Okay. Thank you to Associate Professor Dr. Ahyu C. Omar. Uh, and also thank you for all the speaker, uh, Dr. Ahmad Tufik, PhD, and Dr. Farah Mulya Sali, STMSC. And now before we continue, to the panel discussion, uh, we will watch first a video session about the fission emission from the geological department. Thank you. And now we continue to the final discussion. Uh, and then the first question uh, is from Rafli Akbar from Universitas Pertamina. This question is addressed to Dr. Ahmad Taufik, PhD. The question is, uh, I would like to ask about the nitrate concentration in Bandung Basin. Is it possible that the deeper groundwater would have higher nitrate concentration than at the shallower groundwater. Thank you. This Dr. Akatovic, yes. Dr. Ahmad Taufik. Okay, I think uh, Dr. Ahmad Taufik still have meeting a parallel meeting. Um, we can continue first to the second question. 
This question from uh, Fahri Septianto from Universitas Pertamina. This question is addressed to Dr. Farah Mulyasari. The question is, which one is better to be prepared first? The knowledge of people or the infrastructure to reduce the risk? Thank you. Please, Dr. Farah. Okay, thank you very much, Pak Imam. Uh, thank you also for for your questions. Yes, it's um, very interesting questions. Like, uh, what is the the first one? Um, knowledge or the infrastructure uh, development to reduce the risk? That is, both of them are actually uh, very much uh, closely linked with the mitigation, right? So we know already that we have uh, two types of disaster mitigation: structural and non-structural mitigation. So not both of them, of course, are equally important. But you ask me. But if you ask me whether uh, what is come uh, should come up first uh, should come up first, like knowledge first or infrastructure first, um, I must say maybe at this point of view, um, I think the knowledge of the of the people itself is uh, very much important and is closely linked with the infrastructure of the risk reduction that is going to be used. Taking example of uh, for uh, high technology, um, high tech development with. Uh, a uh, high criteria of, for example, early warning uh, system. So, for example, if we do have a uh, very modern and high tech of uh, disaster uh, early warning system, but if the people do not uh, know how to use and how uh, we can make ensure that the message come uh, received by the people and how actually the people perceive how is the me mechanism transferring the from the scientific data into the um into the instructions of simple actions of risk reduction doing by the people i think i think um there's not so much investment on it so i think that the uh, knowledge of the uh, the local knowledge of the community itself should be uh, enhanced and increased so that the high technology that is going to develop, going to, to employ it by the government, by the institutions, um, can be actually used uh, optimally. So, thank you. Maybe that's uh, my point of view, Pak Imam and Fahri. Okay, thank you, Bupara. Uh, and then we have a next sorry, question. Uh, to ask some more, so I would like also to thank you to Professor Omar and Dr. Taufik for a very nice, interesting presentations closely linked with the research before, like Bandung Basin and disaster resilience of Bandung City, and also the importance of geohazard monitoring within urban areas that help actually increase the not only the technical terms of resilience, but also in terms of to cope with the local people with the disaster itself. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Bupara. And then uh, we continue to the next questions. Uh, it's also addressed to Dr. Farah Mulyasari. Uh, the question from Kifli Nova from Universitas Pertamina. The question is, do better knowledge of people and government policies help us to minimize the risk of geological disaster and geological hazard? Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Pak Imam and also Kevin. I think maybe this one of our students, right, ask uh, these questions. That is also another interesting question because what we have also heard from Professor Omar talking about jihadzat monitoring. For example, we have this at the one side, the local knowledge and the policy of the government and the one side is the work from the expert. So I think if we can combine integrating um, the use, uh, for example, of GRZ monitoring and be endorsed by every cities in the region. And um, if, if we don't have any backup, like local people knowledge and also the policy, because how to put actually the risk reduction actions into, into the real implementations, um, Sometimes it requires uh, also the legal framework or the policy of the region itself. For example, if you're going 
uh, to employ the geohazard monitoring in every city in Indonesia. I think the local government should um, should publish the policy that enables all the local government adopt these systems and being used not only for the academic um, uh, environment, but also uh, like a monitoring system that can be accessed widely and everywhere, every time by the public so that they know that whether they're going to live, for example, in that particular area, it is uh, they are going to be living in a high risk zone or low risk zone, for example. So that is my question and my answer, my response to that question. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Farah Ulyasari. Uh, and then the next question is addressed to Dr. Ahmad Tofi PhD. Uh, the first question from Rafli Akbar from Universitas Pertamina. The question is, uh, I would like to ask about the nitrate concentration in Bandung Basin. Is it possible that the deeper groundwater would have higher nitrate concentration than at the shallower groundwater? Thank you. Please, Pak Ahmad Tofi. Okay, Pak Imam, uh, thank you for the question, uh, the student from the Pertamina University. Uh, in our res in my result, is the shallow is almost higher than the uh, deep ground water, deep ground water, because the uh, source of uh, contaminant is come from the safety waste and also uh, for fertilizer. Fertilizer is uh, in the come to shallow, then maybe they change to the deep ground water. So, of course, uh, shallow is uh, higher than deep ground water. The second one, why the deep ground water is uh, lower than shallow ground water? Because there is a uh, denitrification. Ground, uh, ground water can contaminate the nitrate, but they the process is denitrification. Nitrate become lower and lower in water by the time and by the process. So if the deep ground water should be or should be uh, lower than shallow ground water, I think it's what. But if there is a one point, maybe one or two second point, uh, we can detail the investigations. Maybe the shallow or the sample has come from shallow or the totally shallow has come to the deep ground water. I think it is. Uh, this is the my answer. Okay, thank you, Dr. Amatovic. And then uh, we go to the next question, uh, also addressed to Dr. Amatovic PhD from Matris Nomulio uh, from PT Viraka, Virama Karya KSO. The question is whether the disposal of hospital waste directly to ground will contaminate groundwater and how to dispose of hospital waste so as not to pollute the groundwater. Thank you. Please, Pak Ahmad. Pak Ahmad, sorry, the speakers. Uh, oh, okay, Pak, Pak, Pak Maris. Okay, Pak Maris. Go. Pak, Pak Mat. Sorry, Pak. Mr. Mat. Matrisno Mulyo. Ah, Pak Mas Mulyo, she is my friend. Okay, okay yeah. Pak. The contamination from the hospital, I think uh, many, many, many possible source, not only nitrate, maybe the, uh, the chemical contamination. So if we want to know about the detail of the impact of the waste in the hospital, we have to sample in uh, in close with the we, we have to sample in soil and also in the groundwater near the the hosp the hospital waste. Uh, my study is in the separated in the area. So the point is uh, according the statically in the area in pedifield in the urban area, not to the uh, the specific area. So the result is so general that the all our safety waste, our local safety waste, is possible to leakage to the groundwater. If we want to do the hospital waste is contaminated to the groundwater, we have to sample in the near the hospital sample. But the kind of so the kind of contaminant is so different. Septic waste is nitrate, ammonia, and the hospital. I think 
many more many more chemical septivis i see this is my uh, uh, my answer pa pa imam okay thank you uh, pa ahmad taufik and then we go to the next question uh, uh, this is a quite long question ya pak ahmad the question is from muhammad faris from universitas pertamina uh, the question is uh, whether in bandung has grown water contamination caused by hydrostatic change which is caused by uncontrolled groundwater extraction and catchment area who has turned into an overflow area how to differentiate nitrate from agriculture source natural source septic waste source animal source and atmospheric source and then how to anticipate groundwater pollution migration in metropolitan area like in jakarta or bandung and then can we use zeolith as nitrate contamination filter to reduce nitrate contamination if we can how to maximize zeolith to reduce nitrate contamination okay thank you please pak ahmad oke okay, pak imam this is the long question but i want to uh, try to answer one about the how to determine the possible source to determine what the possible source only by using the isotope by isotope is belong to this nitrate the isotope nitrate or the nitrate isotope the isotope is nitrogen 15 and oxygen 18 this is the stable isotope and the nitrate so because it's stable so we can address the possible isotope and our in, in my research area the isotope can address the possible source it is from uh, safety waste it is from the it come from the safety waste it come from the precipitation or it come from the fertilizer it can determine by isotope after we sampling uh, the nitrate and we separate we put the nitrate isotope and this is the determinant of, from, from the weight of the isotope so this is the way to understand to determine the possible source and we plot in the the grid the second is the uh, metropolitan <coughs> this my 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 last research about metro contaminants it's a, it become worry all the environmental issues uh, environmental engineer so it may be possible come also the other area jakarta of course uh, maybe uh, semarang maybe surabaya maybe uh, other big city area because our system in septivis is not communal it's individual so if the individuals there is a possibility the, the there is a big possibility to leakage because there is no standard it's different in the korea it's different in the malaysia uh, and sorry in singapore the septivis is communal government control the design government control the the pipe so there is less possibility to leakage because in indonesia there is regulation about there is no regulation yet about the safety with individual just people build, build safety with people can build the safety with individual then through the pipe to the uh, drainage there's a possible to there's a big possibility to leakage so this problem it possible of course in jakarta and all indonesian uh, city if there is no uh, safety waste communal system so we we uh, promote it to the the new city and capital city in uh, kalimantan and borneo Pak Ahmad, sorry, the speaker still on. Okay, okay. I think uh, the the last question about zeolite to reduce the nitrate. I think it is possible, possible. Not only zeolite, I think the first is I think you can uh, add by the arang or the arang is I don't know the Indonesian arang is 
like uh, content from the um, uh, clay, clay mineral, clay mineral and clay mineral which is active and can uh, remove the nitrate out of the zeolite that can capture the zeolite from arang or so zeolite. Zeolite also the kind of active the active the minerals that can catch the nitrate. So if we use the field, this filter, I think it can reduce uh, uh, a nitrate before we use it to the become raw water. This is my uh, all uh, question. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ahmad Taufik, PhD. Uh, and then we continue to the next questions. Uh, this question is addressed to Associate uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Rohayu C. Omar. The first question is from Matrisno Mulyo from PT Viramakarya KSO. The question is uh, whether fig mass can be done to anticipate landslide due to seepage. Thank you. Please. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, risk net for what? Okay, I, I repeat again. Uh, whether fig mass can be done to anticipate landslide due to seepage? Fig mass. Fig mass. Fig mass. Uh, whether the fig mass can be done to anticipate landslide due to seepage? Okay, uh, okay. Uh, yes, uh, there, there is a case in uh, one of the la, uh, transmission line in um, uh, there's, uh, there's a eastern eastern part of uh, uh, Peninsula Malaysia. Uh, that, that there is a case that uh, which actually the uh, heat, uh, heat mass actually uh, influence to the uh, stability because of when uh, especially when there is a drought uh, drought occur uh, then uh, that's 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 mean the soil uh, those the soil is uh, reduce their uh, poro uh, reduce the porosity uh, then uh, they start to uh, eroded then from the erosion it, it actually they influence to uh, landslide then we we have uh, uh, the that's mean the database based on uh, the case. Uh, is it uh, correct that what what I understand uh, based on the question actually? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, map Professor map. Rahayu Omar. Map, eh? yeah. Yes, yeah. I think the question is uh, regarding the virtual virtual georeset monitoring and asset management system. Uh, is it can be done to anticipate the landslide uh, due to dissipate? Ah yeah. uh, yes, yes, because we 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 can uh, measure uh, based on the uh, equipment installation. They they, yeah. they indicate uh, they indicate uh, based yeah, based on the indicator. Uh, then the in indicator uh, pop up uh, uh, pop up in the screen. Then uh, when uh, we investigate that. Uh, uh, we found uh, actually what uh, the sources is. Thank you, Associate Professor Dr. Rahayu Omar. And then the next question uh, is still addressed to Professor Rahayu C. Omar. is from uh, Ben Ihsan from Pertamina Geothermal Energy. The question is, uh, is it quite long question? This is an impressive system to monitor geohazard problem and easy to handle by common people. I would like to ask, can this system be integrated with hydrological data such as rainfall intensity from the rainfall station since our environment is in the tropical climate? Rainfall induced landslide will be a common landslide here. And uh, is there any trial that we can try to experience by ourselves since it is a powerful system. Uh, thank you very much. Please. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, actually, the uh, the the system uh, uh, we integrate uh, with the uh, existing uh, rainfall uh, station. Uh, then also we have uh, as another that's me extra. Uh, rainfall station that's near to the 
uh, to the transmission tower itself. Eh. Uh, that's mean the 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 area actually the remote area because we we have a uh, for example uh, one of the uh, the system uh, allocated the remote of uh, Terengganu that we call the state is uh, Terengganu uh, then uh, is actually uh, near to the uh, our uh, TMB dam that call Kenya dams eh? uh, then the this uh, the the uh, hydrological uh, system actually allocate at that uh, near to the dam then but the uh, we have another one uh, rainforest station that we uh, that's where we built uh, uh, for the purpose of that uh, integration eh? another one then uh, based on the result actually we integrate eh, from the uh, station uh, from our uh, our uh, that we call uh, the ID is uh, main for uh, drainage in uh, irrigation department, eh? and then we integrate uh, with that data uh, with our uh, data itself. Then uh, based on that, uh, we uh, calculate or model the threshold. Uh, uh, then from that threshold, actually they, they indicate the uh, how that's the the uh, the lens, uh, landslide occurrence and also the the we predict actually uh, can be predict based uh, based on the uh, data that we collect uh, then uh, that data uh, actually in the system we can uh, automate eh, automate uh, calculate uh, the uh, rainfall intensity as example uh, and also the pore pressure uh, based on the graph that but but in behind the uh, system at uh, the algorithm we we use a statistical uh, method uh, to show that uh, uh, that's mean that, um, this uh, when we see that in the screen uh, we can see how that's the results goes that's mean uh, uh, the algorithm in in behind the system uh, allocate to integrate uh, the all the uh, data uh, added the data from the uh, ministry, that's mean the department, and also our data itself. Uh, is it I answer the uh, question? No. Yes, yes, I think it's already answered the question. Uh, and we have a additional question also from still from Mr. Ben Isan from Pertamina Geotherm Energy, uh, still addressed to Professor Rahayu. The question is, uh, are there any solution to remove the canopy effect beside using LIDAR since LIDAR is a bit expensive method to do? Ah, this uh, okay, uh, in um, our study, uh, we not, uh, the LIDAR was uh, only used uh, in when uh, minimum in minimum case eh, because it's uh, high cost. Uh, that but we use uh, the satellite imagery uh, that uh, because we have a, a ground station uh, then we uh, use a, for example um, a variety of uh, low resolution like modis or aqua uh, then uh, we integrate uh, with uh, median uh, resolution of satellite uh, then actually the result uh, the result actually uh, when we use uh, AI modeling using uh, artificial, artificial intelligence, uh, the result is actually as good as um, when you we use LiDAR. That's me. We use a technology uh, to do, to reduce the cost, but but need to bear in mind that when we use a low resolution and medium resolution, uh, uh, we cannot see it as uh, look like as a um, what what we can see in photo, but it gives uh, in term of the index value. But when we enhance this using the uh, AI process, then we can see a good um, that's mean good image. Like uh, last uh, in our my presentation, I did show that how we enhance the from the low resolution image that's mean the modis. Then we can get uh, a good uh, uh, portal image. 
Uh, that's that's the uh, different actually uh, between lidar and the uh, satellite uh, when we use a low resolution multimedia resolution. Okay, but we can replace uh, the lidar. Then uh, when we need to indicate, uh, that's mean the most um, problematic area, then we use the lidar. That's mean not all. That's mean we, we selected only to use the lidar because we like to reduce the cost. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Professor Rahayu. And then the next question. Uh, still addressed to Professor Rohayu C. Omar. The question is from Nur Aliyah Nur Ismail from University Technology Petronas. Uh, the question is um, amazing work on the data integration and visualization. I wonder if, is, if it is applicable to investigating seabed as well. Is there any sub-zero deep limitation on the acquisition? And how do you cope with the uncertainties in deeper sea floor? Looking forward to answer. Thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, can you repeat the question? Okay. Uh, the question is amazing work on the data integration and visualization. I wonder if it is applicable to investigating seabed as well. Is there any sub-zero deep limitation on the acquisition? And how do you cope with the uncertainties in the sea floor? Looking forward for your answer. Okay. Uh, 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 how we cope with the uncertainty? Uh, uh, because we we not only um, is uh, it's still a long time actually not what what you see. Uh, that I present is not uh, one and actually is not one year uh, uh, research. Eh? Uh, actually, because uh, I start uh, with uh, the concept that uh, Ibu Farah uh, said that there is that this is a concept that concept uh, I'm use that concept to develop uh, the the system. Then based on that concept, how we implement based on uh, measure planning process or an integration all the technique, uh, new technology, eh? then that's, that's what we, we get now. Uh, it's take uh, almost um, uh, 10 years uh, to get that, uh, the, what we have now. That's mean we start with the uh, data to, to know that's how the condition of the uh, uh, planning process, how the planning processes can be, uh, in, uh, the data can be integrated into the planning process uh, to 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 uh, uh, to that's mean to uh, to manage the uh, disaster uh, resilient to to ensure that DDR concept is applied. Eh? Okay, then based on the data, uh, we uh, we model uh, that's mean uh, if we see that there is a problem, we need to go to the site to identify that uh, our collecting data. Uh, our data we get actually is uh, good enough uh, because uh, the data is most important uh, when we need to use in terms of uh, DDR concept. Eh? Uh, that, that's why we, we need to manage the data. Okay, then uh, how we manage the data? That's mean all the data uh, we ensure is uh, uh, that's mean the sensitivity of the data itself must be accurate as it is. Eh? Uh, then uh, let's say if 100%, we make sure is uh, only uh, the, the uncertainty is only up to uh, almost 98%. Because we need to uh, ensure that later on, government can use it. Uh, because the, the data, if we use a uh, bad data that's me uh, the that's me what uh, when we use a bad data that's me the output letter is not uh, accurate enough eh? and then uh, beside that uh, uh, when we integrate the, uh, the data uh, we uh, we ensure that uh, at the first uh, when we have a death study and we have a model uh, we go to site uh, that's mean in lab then go to site 
to make sure that what we uh, get the data uh, the data for example uh, there is a uh, the condition is uh, like a failure there is a failure uh, to know that is it correct or not we we confirm to the site that's me uh, not only the the process of integration but also the validation the validation process uh, based on the valid pro uh, validation process that we go through uh, year by year then we ensure that our data is um, accurate then that's why we can use it uh, as a um, transforming process uh, not only uh, we go to site but we can uh, we can get the uh, the information through the virtual reality okay the i answer that uh, for the whole question yes i think already answered the question okay thank you professor rahayu and then uh, the next question is also addressed to professor rahayu uh, is from Khalid Rizki from Universitas Pertamina. The question is, uh, is there another consideration as a data to make this fit mesh better than is there any kind of problem to utilize it for public use? And what is the limitation of the fit mesh? Thank you, Farah. Okay. Uh... Uh, that uh, the heat uh, heat mat uh, uh, we we use it a combination actually the uh, satellite data and also the um, existing data that's in the secondary data that we get from the uh, planning uh, de development uh, and agriculture development uh, then uh, also for the if uh, for urbanization uh, we get the also for the uh, our um, what uh, that's mean the the authorities eh? our authorities then we combine it uh, then uh, based on the heat uh, map actually uh, we also uh, similar to the thing to the uh, landslide map uh, because we have um, uh, analysis uh, that's mean the data uh, technical data eh? that is called technical data we measure also the uh, as example, uh, using camera, uh, thermal camera, uh, we we uh, get the data, then uh, we compare it. Uh, is it the data that we uh, get from heat map is actually accurate or not? Okay, and uh, then uh, the the mostly data uh, for heat map, uh, I'm using a combination of the. Uh, satellite data eh, uh, for the for the uh, to to get the uh, heat map. Then then uh, when get, uh, we get the heat map letter, uh, we um, compare with the uh, technical data that we collect on site. Okay, uh, that's my answer. Okay, thank you, Professor Ayu. Uh, and then the next question uh, is addressed to Dr. Farah Mulyasari, STMSC. Uh, the question is from Ahmad Budi Abu. And the question is, how is the study continuity of tsunami along the west coast of Sulawesi Island after a tsunami induced by earthquake on 2018? And then, uh, is there any further research about the danger of Palu's earthquake that caused by Palu Coral Fault? Okay, thank you. Please, Dr. Farah. Okay, thank you very much, Pak Imam. And also, thank you for the, uh, the questions. So, um, I must say that I have been really personally involved in the research for earthquake 
or risk assessment in Palu Koro, but um, in terms of maybe social uh, and economic or environmental aspects, um, there, there is some discussion going on. But coming back to the questions, how is actually so far the analysis of this uh, Palu Koro fault system in Sulawesi region? So as we might know that uh, Sulawesi is a region that has a lot of faults and potential to generate earthquake disasters like two years ago uh, during the month of October. So these potential disasters not only causing by the um, uh, by the active faults on land, but also on the uh, earthquake that is originate uh, in the in the ocean, so on the coastline. So I have read actually research recently from our. Um, BMKG, like a climatology and geophysics uh, national agency. So the, they have studying um, about these Palo Coro active faults um, tectonics in uh, Sulawesi. And in the aims, the study is actually aiming on the analysis of the seismicity around these Palo Coro fault zones. So they have done this uh, seismicity analysis that is carried out by determining the locations and also the source of mechanisms of the earthquakes um, that are occurred in that particular area. So in around the Palo Coro Fault, using the earthquake signals data that are recorded uh, on their database. So what I'm trying to say here to answer the question is that these earthquake signals or data were stored. And um, so when they're storing this data, so they can uh, actually determine the hypocenter for each event that was carried out uh, with their uh, particular um, method. So what I've known is that there is exist this single event determination method it. So then the, the location of the hypocenter uh, can be performed using the joint hypocenter relocation determination. So it in, involves actually a lot of software data analysis and storing in a database. Uh, of course, uh, this data is not coming up from the um, geophysical uh, or geodetic like positioning system, but also from the originally mapping from the geologists. So what I'm trying to say is that if there is both analysis from the scientific point of view, the data were stored, but if it's not communicated appropriately and on time to the local public, I think uh, uh, this, um, this scientific analysis or research uh, would not be optimum. So I think that they said be uh, an, um, uh, an inherent or uh, or an holistic approach, not only from the uh, scientific analysis, but how we can actually translate this scientific analysis into the understanding to prepare the community uh, for future disasters in that particular area. So I think that's my uh, answer for the questions related to the seismic analysis of the Palo Coro uh, fault zone in Sulawesi. Okay. I hope questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Farah Uliasari. Okay, uh, finally, we already finished all of the panel discussion. Uh, thank you very much to all the speakers, Dr. Ahmad Tafik, PhD, Dr. Farah Uliasari, SDMSC, and Associate Professor Dr. Rohayud C. Omar. And also thank you for participating in this panel discussion. Before we close the panel discussion, uh, I would like to share uh, some conclusion during this webinar. The first conclusion uh, regarding the environmental geology, uh, as we know that environmental geology have a close relationship with the water resources. Uh, as, as explained by Dr. Ahmad Taufik, the issue of water resources, especially uh, in the groundwater disaster. The water disaster, uh, we can say about the quantity and the quality issue. Quantity regarding the drawdown groundwater, the land subsidence, and also the quality issue. Uh, from the study with Dr. Amatovic, uh, the example is the nitrate quality issue and also the leakage. And also, uh, we both know that uh, the problem of environmental geology is also uh, happen in the big city. The example is in Bandung and Jakarta. 
uh, this like this study from Dr. Ahmad Taufik and also Dr. Farah. Uh, study is also in uh, Bandung City, yeah, which have a lot of uh, community and of, a lot of uh, people in the Bandung City. And then the second conclusion regarding the disaster risk management for urban region. Uh, as before I explained regarding the disaster risk management, we know that the increasing population is the issue in the world and also in the Asia. Uh, the issue, uh, for example, urbanization and then sanitation and solid waste, health, poverty, and also the infrastructure. Uh, and the research from Dr. Farah Mulyasari regarding the climate-related disaster resilience index or CDRI tools uh, is a very good uh, study and uh, study regarding the disaster management especially for the urban region and then the next conclusion regarding the biohazard monitoring system we have a very good technology that already explained by uh, the associate professor Dr. Rahayu C. Omar uh, regarding the biohazard monitoring system uh, the system is virtual geohazard monitoring and asset management system or fitness system it combines uh, existing data and also primary data and also satellite image uh, it, it can help to promote efficient and transparent practice in management risk and aid in governance process the fitness it's already improved uh, the operation performance especially the efficiency capex cost cost saving and increase the work protection and also the feed mesh can reduce the patrolling and hazing ability yeah, to strategy plan for long-term situation and also can maintain the security of the operation okay uh, i think that is the conclusion of this final discussion uh, thank you very much uh, now i return this webinar event to mc please uh, ratu anisa thank you Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Imam, for guiding all the topic presentations and also the panel discussions. Also, thanks to Mr. Taufik, Mrs. Farah, and Mrs. Rohayu for the new insights that were delivered by your incredibly, incredibly interesting presentations. Hopefully, all the previous sessions will give us another point of view of the topics that we've discussed. I would also like to thank the audience for your enthusiasm. Hopefully you will be more curious and the discussion that we did today will be useful for you in the future. We almost come to the end of the webinar, but before that we have a profile video playback of the lecturers at Geological Engineering Department. Please enjoy. Ask you to please turn on your, 
turn on your camera because our team is going to take a photo for documentation. 